Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us, and thank you for gathering us together to be in your house, Lord. Open your word up, Lord. Show us what thus saith the Lord. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be good ground. Help us to be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Before we read in Psalm 78, notice up underneath Psalm 78, it introduces a title. It says, Maskil of Asaph. A maskil is an instructive poem. Keep that in mind as you read the Psalms. <clears throat> maskil of Asaph. Asaph was a, a Levite who was a worship leader when David was king. And he led worship in the tabernacle before the temple of Solomon was built. And the psalms that he wrote was made to convict and remind of the grace and the goodness of God. So think on these things as we read this. Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and I will utter dark sayings of old which we have learned, heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the, faith, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he establisheth a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the work of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be, as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of the Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the lands of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as an heap in the daytime. Also, he led them with a cloud and all, and all the night with them a light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the de great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And, yet, and they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. They tempted God in their heart and by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God, can God, Furnish a table in the wilderness. Behold, he smote the rock, and the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this, and was wroth, and so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Because they believed not in God, and trusted not in his salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice in verse 19, it says, they ask the question, can God? And look down in verse 20. It says, can he? And it says it again, can he? The title of this message is, God can. 
God can. From a person who is doubting, for a person who is unsure, oftentimes people say, can God? Can God? But a person who is walking in the Spirit, a person who has seen God work in his life time and time again, a person who has walked the, the, the straight in there and followed the Lord and followed him and tried him try time and time again, we ought to be saying, God can. God can. And the Jews, they were a people who had seen God work time and time and time again, and yet they oftentimes looked back and said, can God, can God. Whenever you forget how good God has been to you, you oftentimes ask the question, can God? But you need to remember, God can. God can. Let's go to, let's think on this. The first point I want to make is God can save. God can save. Every person in here today who's born again ought to be able to testify that God can. God can save. Notice in verse 13 it says, He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as in heat. Notice that, that them crossing the Red Sea, them fleeing out of Egypt, that is a picture, that is a picture of God's saving grace. The blood that was applied to the doorpost of their house and the wrath of God passing over them, that is a picture of salvation. That is a picture of the blood being applied to your soul. And then God leading them out of the land of Egypt, that is a picture of God sanctifying you and setting you apart, setting you out and leading you out of the world, out of the darkness of the world, and leading you to follow him. And them crossing the Red Sea, that is a picture of believer's baptism after you got saved. After you got saved and God set you apart, the first thing every Christian ought to do is get baptized in water. And then after they crossed the Red Sea, what did they do? They got the law, the word of God. After you follow in believer's baptism, after you have been saved, after you have been baptized, every believer ought to be a believer of the word of God and get the instructions from the word of God and learn from them and walk with the Lord day by day. So that is a picture of our salvation, an Old Testament type or a picture. God can save. I heard it quoted in the song that was sung, God is not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's go to Hebrews 7.25. Hebrews 7.25. Wherefore, he is what? Able. He is able. God can, right? He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 18, verse 11, excuse me. For the Son of Man is come to do what? Save that which is lost. Y'all are in Matthew. Let's just turn to the next page to Matthew 19, 24. Matthew 19, 24. 
And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceeding amazed and said, Who then can be saved? That's one of them can God questions, right? But verse 26 says, God can. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let that be an encouragement to you today. Maybe you're in here today and you're struggling with praying for a lost relative today. Maybe you're in here, you have wet your couch with tears, praying for that young child to come to Jesus. Maybe you have wet your couch with tears, praying for a parent or a grandparent that's very soon to meet God. Let that be an encouragement to you that God is able to save. We must be faithful to continue in prayer for them. We must be faithful to continue to witness to them. But remember, don't you ever think that somebody is past saving. Let that be an encouragement to you. The thief on the cross is proof that God can save. There are heretics today that go around saying that there are people who walk the world today that's impossible to be saved. Let God be the deciding factor of that because God can. God can save. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6 and beginning in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But God, but you have been washed. But you have been sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Many of you have a past. We all have a past if we've been saved by God's grace. Many of us have had worldly vices that were cha- we were chained to. Many of you were, str- were chained to a beer bottle. Many of you were chained to a whiskey bottle. Some of you may have been chained to drugs and alcohol. Many of you have been chained to many worldly vices. But you are living, breathing proof that God can save. By the grace of God, God can save Maybe you're in here today and you're lost and you're wondering, can God save a sinner as wicked as I? Maybe you're in here today and you think that it is impossible to save a man like me. There are lots of times that there will be people in prison on death row and think there is no hope for me on the other side. Let me tell you, by the grace of God, God can save. With man, it is impossible, though. With man, it is impossible. With man, your religion will lead you to hell. But by the grace of God, if you come to Jesus and trust Him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, if you will truly come to Him and repent of your sins and plead the blood of Jesus Christ, He will save you to the uttermost and you can walk away saying, God can. God can save. One thing that God also can do is God can lead. Notice that in Psalms 78, I want to point out to you how people questioned how God can lead as well. Psalm 78 verse 14 says this. Psalm 78 14 says, In the daytime, he 
Also, he led them. Also, he led them. He led them with a cloud. And all the night, a light of fire. The Lord can lead. And trust me, if you follow the Lord's leadership, if you follow his word, he'll never lead you the wrong way. You may not be, understand why you're going through what you're going through, but trust him. Don't ask the question, can God? Don't ask the question, does God know where he's going? Trust me, he knows where he's leading you. It may seem like a dark and scary place at the moment, but understand while you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Turn with me to Psalm 23. I mentioned it, so let's go there. Let's talk about the Lord's leadership. Psalm 23. Most of you can probably quote it. A lot of people are taught to memorize it as a child, but let's go there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know what that means? He's going to take care of you. No matter where he leads you, he will take care of you. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. There's food for you. There's drink for you. The Lord has provided. If you, if you, are, if you have not eaten a day in your life, you would not be alive today. Most of you are alive today because God has provided a meal for you. You can't live without water. You can't live without water. Most of you are alive today because the Lord has provided you what you need to be alive today. He maketh you to lie down in green pastures. He maketh you to, uh, he leadeth you beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Here it is again. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He'll never lead you down the wrong road. He'll never lead you down the wrong road. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he may lead you through dark and scary places. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I think the Lord knows where he's leading you. And if it seems like a dark and scary place, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Let his rod and his staff comfort you because he is the good shepherd. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's a man who has been blessed because he has followed the Lord. Surely goodness is... And mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David was a man who wrote this from the perspective of God can. God can. He did not question the good shepherd whenever he wrote this. He wrote this as a way of assuring that the Lord is the good shepherd and he knows where he's leading you. You may seem, it may seem like a dark and scary place. It may seem like you don't, you're not certain of the future, but understand the one who is leading you by your hand knows where he's taking you. Do not be faithless and ask the question, can God, God can lead. God can lead. God can also provide. God can also provide. Y'all are in Psalms. Let's go back to our text in Psalm 78. Verse 15. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him, provoking the Most High in the wilderness. Notice how he was faithful to provide for them even whenever they didn't deserve it. He has been faithful to provide for you when you didn't deserve it either. The Lord is faithful to provide. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 says this. 
Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for the body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. This is a very appropriate verse to read in springtime. Everything's blooming and blossoming, and everything is, all the flowers are coming out. They came out even after wintertime. Every winter, it all goes away. Springtime, it all comes back. The birds, they lay more eggs, and you see birds coming out of the nests in the springtime because God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the grass of the field. God takes care of the trees. Despite how wintertime looks, springtime will always be around the corner. God can always provide. Maybe you're going through a period where it's wintertime and you're wondering what on earth is going on? How on earth am I going to have food in my fridge? How on earth am I going to buy clothes for my kids? How on earth am I going to get through this billing period? How on earth am I going to get through this dry season? Understand, it may be wintertime right now, but springtime is right around the corner. God, if he can clothe the grass of the field, if he can take care of the birds in their nest, he can take care of you too. God can save. God can lead. God can provide. We need to hear this today. God can restore. God can restore. Psalm 78 is a psalm of Asaph. And during Hezekiah's revival, let's turn to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29. Verse 1, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify your, now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Everything that's dirty in here, every idol in the house of the Lord, get it out. That's what the king said. And that's what you ought to treat your temple. That's how you ought to treat your temple. We are all temples of the Holy Spirit. Anything that is unclean, anything that's unholy in your life, rest in the fact that God can help you get it out. God can help you get it out. Our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Our God hath forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitations of the Lord and turned their backs and they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Lots of times people will backslide. Lots of times people will not make God their priority. Lots of times work and, and things of that nature becomes a bigger priority. There are a lot of people today, unfortunately, make a priority out of their career. 
And I'm saying it's good to have a job. It's good to work. It's good to provide for your family. But lots of times people will be more concerned about their career growth more so than following the Lord. God will take care of you. God will take care of you better than any career can ever take care of you. Lots of times people will just lose sight of God. And sometimes sports season rolls around and people are watching the TV. People are watching the ball God and they don't make a priority of going to church. They don't make a priority of following the Lord. They don't make a priority of seeking the Lord early in the morning and praying to him and talking to him each and every day. They don't make a priority out of following his word. Don't let that discourage you. Repent of it and get the idols out of your temple. God can restore. Turn with me to verse 30. Let's skip on down to verse 30. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praises unto the Lord with the words of David and of who? Asaph, the seer, the one who wrote Psalm 78. Whenever they were in a state of revival, they were reading the very psalm, more than likely, that you just read. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. Hezekiah wanted a relationship with God like his father David did. And he did not say, well, we're, we're too past revival. He didn't say... God can't fix this mess that we're in. He stood and he said, God can. Get the garbage out. Let's get the good stuff in. God can restore us. Many, many, many people today are saying, can God restore my life? Can God restore my home? Can God restore my marriage? Can God restore my kids? Can God restore this church? God restored Israel in the times of Hezekiah. God restored Israel whenever they came out of Babylonian captivity. Whenever Cyrus became king of Persia, all of the children came out of Babylonian captivity. Zerubbabel rebuilt the, the temple. Ezra restored the, the, the priesthood. And Nehemiah built the walls back. Israel is a living, breathing testimony of regardless of where you've been through, regardless of the muck that you've been drugged through, regardless of the, the stray paths you've wandered down, God can always get you back and restore you right back where you were. Think of the prodigal son. He wandered and wallowed in the hog pen. He ate pig food. A Jewish boy hanging out with pigs. And God restored him right back to the Father's house. Each and every one of us is a testimony. If you're saved by the grace of God, is a testimony of God can. Times like these... Times like these mean discouragement for a lot of people. There are a lot of preachers today who are just closing their Bibles and saying, we'll never see revival anymore. Whenever our Lord said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Oh sure, there are lots of churches going apostate. I talked about that during Sunday school. There are a lot of churches out there compromising, but whenever a church has reached the point of compromise, it's no longer worthy to be considered a church. It's a cult. But the churches that stand where God stands, the churches that stand on the solid rock of God's word, the churches that lean on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and are faithful to preach it, are faithful to teach it, are faithful to evangelize the world with it, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And while many churches are sitting there with their heads down and saying, we're just going to hang on by a thread to the rapture, I want to go out 
with a ha- I want to be heaven down with a ha- heaven bound with a hammer down. I want to be shouting amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me all the way up into glory. I want to have the joy of the Lord as I preach to this church. And you ought to have the joy of the Lord as you serve him each and every day. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Wednesday night. Not just on Sunday night. You ought to have the joy and the confidence of the Lord in your heart and telling the world that God can. Turn with me to Psalm 78 and we're going to wrap this up. You can assure, you can assure future generations. You can assure faithful generations if you are faithful to teach the children in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. Notice it says in verse 5 of Psalm 78. Let's go back to verse 1 for context. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and I will utter dark sayings of old. He's saying, I will utter dark sayings of old. I'm going to tell you things that you should know, but you need to remind yourself each and every day, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children, from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works which he hath done. You know what he's saying? Tell your children God can. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, gave them their, gave them his word, which he commanded our fathers, and they should make them known unto their children that the generation to come might know them. Even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. You want to know why you see apostate generations? Do you want to know why our children are failing? Because we are not telling them that God can. We're not telling them that God can. We are not victims. We're victors. We are not victims licking our wounds. If you are saved by the grace of God, you ought to be singing and shouting the victory. The reason why a lot of children wonder, a lot of children go off and rebel, is because we sometimes fail to tell them that God can and we give them a reason to rebel. They look and they see the hypocrisy in our lives. We see the doubt in our heart and they say, well, why would I want that? Why on earth would we want that? You want to know why we have drag queens reading in our libraries today? You want to know why You see all this going on today out in the world because a few generations ago they took prayer and Bible reading out of the schools. You want to know why there are hardened criminals taunting the families of those that they murdered? In the courtroom, I heard a story of a man who murdered a child brutally. And a mother stood up and said, I just want to let you know as much harm as you've done our family. In the name of the Lord, I forgive you. And the whole time she was testifying what they've been through and testifying their forgiveness. He was taunting them to their face. He was taunting them to their face. Let me tell you something. He probably did that because he did not fear the courtroom that he was in. They may not fear the courtroom that they're in, but you know, if they had walked by the Ten Commandments sign, that may be a little reminder that they're going to stand in another courtroom one day and they won't have such an arrogant smirk on their face. 
And I'll tell you this, if you're lost without God, you're going to stand in that courtroom one day. Let me finish the rest of the story. That young man who was taunting that mother and taunting her as she was testifying what he had done to their family, as he taunted her and mocked her forgiveness, the father come up out of the chair and he was going to put his hands on him and there was a couple men who held him back and that man testified, if I had got my hands around his neck, there would have been nobody to save him. I would have killed him with my bare hands. Likewise, if you're in here today, the only thing holding the wrath of God against you is the grace of God. And one day, if you die unsaved, the wrath of God will get his hands around your neck and you'll burn and die in hell. You'll burn in hell forever. But you can walk away today you can walk away today with a testimony of God can. God can save. Jesus bled and died for your sins. He bled and died for your sins. We're all guilty. We're all fit candidates for the wrath of God. And the world mocks God today. They're no different than that arrogant punk who mocked that family in his courtroom. They're saying they've reserved a month of pride month. They're mocking God to his face. One day if they don't repent and get saved and trust Jesus as their Savior, the wrath of God will come all over them like that father would have come all over that boy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus died on an old rugged cross. He was buried and he rose from the grave on the third day. Anyone and everyone who will repent of their sins, trust him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior can walk away with the testimony of God can. God can save. God can provide. God can lead. God can restore. Maybe you're in here today and you've been discouraged. Maybe you're in here today and you're, you've backslid. Maybe you're in here today and your walk with the Lord isn't what it was yesterday. Maybe you're in here today and your walk with the Lord is not the way it used to be. God will never leave you nor forsake you. God can restore your walk with Him. Maybe you're in here today and you're discouraged. God can restore your broken heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I preached your word. Let this be an encouragement to us in Jesus' name. Amen. If God's spoken to your heart, why don't you come as the Lord leads?